all our distinguished. Wait, wait, now. Good afternoon again to our distinguished panelists um, and our participants joining us from different parts of the world. My name is Daniela Ngarambe and I'm a research associate at the African School of Regulation. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this third day of our conference on private investment in transmission in Africa. Uh, we started the conference two days ago, first with an overview of the current situation of uh, transmission investment in Africa. Then we continued with um, uh, discussing the ITP approach as well as regulatory modifications. Today will be, uh, if you missed those two days, you're in luck. Professor Ignacio will be providing us with a recap of those two days, and we'll go straight into um, a call to action. Uh, but before we do that, um, allow me to share some housekeeping notes. Um, first of all, the moderator will first introduce the speakers by their names, um, positions and organizations, um, more information on our speakers available on the website, so please feel free to check that. Um, secondly, if time allows, we'll, we'll take in questions from the audience. Um, the event is being recorded, so you'll get a chance to rewatch it if you, if, you, if you need so. And interpretation is available for our French speakers. Um, so uh, you can click at the bottom of your screens and that option will be made available to you. And uh, lastly, uh, please enjoy the session, uh, Professor Ignacio. Thank you, Daniela. And I hope that you can hear me well. Uh, is that right, Daniela? Yes, that's right. Okay. And then you can see my screen. And we can so, see your screen. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us in this last uh, session of this three-day conference. My role uh, now will be to uh, wrap up uh, for those who have not been able to attend sessions uh, one and two, and to uh, highlight uh, what has been presented, the basic ideas, uh, and to also tell you about the open issues and what are the key lessons that I think that have been learned. Uh, for that, um, my presentation will consist of first a quick confirmation of what we already know that everybody has repeated in the different panels. Second, I will present what experts have said that could, could be considered new uh, during the first and second days. Third, um, well, what they said basically was the, the model of uh, independent transmission project is a model that makes sense. But why private investment, therefore, is not happening? And we have some reasons for that. Then uh, we will look at what are the consequences of realizing how things should be done, but are not done. And finally, uh, a list of the identified open issues and difficulties that had to be overcome uh, to make this uh, approach happening. So let's start with the confirmation of what we already knew before starting this conference. We knew that T for transmission is critical for power systems to perform well. We know that there is basically no private investment happening in transmission in Africa. We know that much more investment is needed uh, and that um, public money cannot fund all the money that is needed uh, to build all the transmission that has to be uh, invested deployed in Africa, so that we need private investment. But private investment, everybody said, needs predictability that the cost of service will be paid for. And that means including, of course, an attractive return on investment. And that requires correct, transparent, and stable regulation. So these are things that we knew before starting the conference. So during the conference, the experts have told us that the independent transmission project approach makes sense. And that in most cases seems to be the only reasonable way to go, given the difficulties of finding other sources of funding and other, um, other constraints. So this is the way to go, not for an entire uh, network um, in a country, but for critical projects, projects that are important that could be approached with this uh, model, ITP. 
And also, and this is what we have seen in the case of Brazil, uh, for a gradual piecemeal development of an entire world, all the reinforcement that are needed are done in pieces uh, using this approach. Um, Ryan yesterday was presenting some principles um, that I have summarized here. He presented five, I have condensed that into four, um, saying that this model, IPT, uh, is not the source of any uh, uh, problem of security or lack of control in the network. Uh, because the network, if it, things are well organized in a country, is operated by a single system operator. And the system operator treats all the assets that have been connected in the network in the same way, regardless the ownership. Second, that IPT is a, such a simple model, business model, that could be implemented with any regulation. And that we know how to deal with this business model because the IPP model for production, for generation, has been in use in African countries for many years. And basically, um, the ITP model obeys to the same principles. Finally, that a, an advantage of this ITP model is that the revenues for the entire economic life of the asset or the concession uh, that in the contract uh, is awarded to some company is perfectly predictable. So it is perfectly known how much each year you have to pay to the owner of this IPT model. So why this is not happening now if it is so easy? Well, I dare to say that decision makers and their consultants, many times clueless, I must say, don't understand transmission. Uh, lots of people that I have found think that the nature of transmission is to purchase power in where it is cheaper and sell it when it is more expensive uh, and therefore being paid for how much it is transported or the difference between the prices of what is bought and what is sold. Um, this is a mindset to be abolished. And in the most advanced uh, systems in the world, in entire Europe, uh, in the power pools in the United States, in Central America and South America, in Australia, in India, uh, that has been abandoned, that way of thinking. And let me, let me tell you a, a personal story because I think that it is representative. So I was a student uh, of this professor, Fred Schweppe, um, many years ago, 40 years ago at MIT. And he um, well, was teaching this book. I hope that you can see that in your small screen, uh, Spot Pricing of Electricity. So he was the somehow inventor of short-term marginal prices, locational marginal prices, in electricity, and I was his student. So uh, the idea was that the network was purchasing at as the normal prices and selling at the normal prices. And it was implicit in the book, it is said in the book that I studied repeatedly, that um, the remuneration of transmission would come in a natural way from application of normal prices, buying and selling. Well, in March, 1990, so 34 years ago, when I had finished my studies at MIT, I was a consultant for the National Grid Company in the UK, and I spent a month and a half in London uh, trying to apply this theory because um, the UK was liberalizing the power sector at the moment, and, and, and they wanted to know how to remunerate transmission. So I was a consultant with a group of two other people from MIT, and I spent that time running computer models, trying to apply novel prices to remunerate transmission. And I failed miserably. And we had to acknowledge that our method didn't work. So I came back to my institute in Madrid and we, do, we did some research and we came up for the first time uh, with the solution to that puzzle. And the solution is that spot prices are great to send short-term energy signals to the participants, but they are they do a very poor job in remunerating transmission 
because of a number of things that I cannot do and have time to tell you now, uh, but they have to do with economies of scale, uh, with reliability constraints, uh, with the discreteness uh, of transmission investments, et cetera, et cetera. So in the end, in a well-developed network, typically buying and selling recovers about 20% of the cost of the network. So it's a very bad idea to apply this idea of spot pricing, buying and selling. It is necessary a change of mindset and to think of infrastructure, uh, transmission, sorry, as an infrastructure that has to be remunerated as a natural monopoly and paid cost of service and forget this buying and selling. This is what Europe has done, what power pools in the United States has done, what Australia has done, India, Central America, uh, South America, not Africa. So, but it is difficult to, to change this old mindset because of course we know that transmission started with some hydro uh, plant that was far from a city or far from a mine and a transmission line was built to feed from that power plant to that load. And of course, well, the, the transmission line wanted to make money by transporting power from what is was cheaper to where it was more expensive. And then if somebody wanted to connect a second um, maybe power plant or an industrial uh, or load at the other end uh, to that line, they had to pay for the additional flow that was going through this line. So this primitive idea has persisted, and, and but it is completely unviable when you have a mess network, when you have networks like this, this is Nigeria, how, how can you track the flow? I, I, I know about that. I have, <laughs> I have written a textbook on electromagnetic field theory that was in my university, the textbook for 25 years. And I, I know that it's impossible to know what is the origin of the electrons that arrive to some load and to attribute that to any particular generator. It is physically impossible. So um, the mindset has to be modified. And when you look at, at not only one country, when you look at the entire uh, Western Africa power pool that is meshed, uh, this uh, way of thinking, of wheeling, of buying and selling from one point to another one is not the way to go. You have to think of a regulated monopoly and infrastructure that has to be paid regulatorily the cost of service. And uh, it is very clear in my mind, and I think in the minds of many people now, that it is the way to go. Uh, look at the uh, the power pool. Uh, I mean, the the this is PJM um, in the United States with ten thousand novel prices with all these. Um, uh, I mean, they compute novel prices every five minutes, but they don't use novel prices to remunerate transmission. Okay, so again, transmission consists in deploying long-lived infrastructure assets, keeping them in good operational conditions. It is a business of pylons, wires, uh, insulators, protections, communication. It is a natural monopoly that must be regulated. Once this is understood, what is needed is to be brave, to change the mindset, and to face the consequences, to see what where this is going to lead us. Okay, so what are the consequences of understanding transmission? Well, um, if we have one or a few national transmission projects, what we have to do is a number of steps and they are not difficult to understand. Step number one is to define the physical asset. We did a line that goes from point A to point B, and uh, we could estimate more or less what could be an upper limit of the cost that that line could have uh, if somebody will build that for us. Second is to define a long-term service contract to provide that service, to build the line and to maintain it, uh, and to keep in, in good order for a number of years, maybe 30 years, and to conduct an auction or maybe a bilateral deal, but an auction could reveal the lowest, the least cost uh, to do that, 
to find a company that will offer uh, a, the least annual revenue requirement for the contract to provide that service. And then step three is, okay, we have to pay that. And of course, I understand that in Africa, um, the distribution companies that collect the money are in dire financial condition. And therefore, it is difficult uh, to, uh, well, to, to keep money for something. But we have to, to realize that to pay those individual uh, critical uh, transmission projects that are not many, uh, we have to realize that those projects will be a small fraction of the total cost of transmission in that country. And transmission is about 10% of the cost of the tariff. So we are talking about maybe 5% or 10% of 10%. So 1% of the cost of the tariff. So I think that that should be possible to reinvent in some way. So the, the viability, and I've heard that word several times during the conference, that the project needs to be viable. No, this is the wrong mindset. The, a project, I mean, a transmission line that is regulated is always viable uh, because the cost of building and maintaining that line is regulated and therefore there is security about it. It doesn't have to make money by buying and selling, wrong mindset. Uh, it has to be regulated and recover the cost. Um, and of course, there is one of difficulty here, which is how to reinvent the small fraction of the money that is collected with the tariffs to pay those projects. Of course, this is a measure of the commitment of the government and the regulator to have these few critical transmission reinforcements uh, built. And it doesn't have any impact on sovereign debt because everything is done with private capital. When we move to uh, cross-border transmission projects, things get more complex, but not that much complex. So what happens with a cross-border transmission project? Step one and step two are the same. We have to define the physical asset that is needed. And as you can see uh, with the, um, the Continental Master Plan, um, uh, these projects have been already defined and quantified. So the second is again to define a long-term service contract to conduct an auction and to find a firm that offers the least cost revenue requirement for the duration of the contract. Now there is a new step, step three, only one step new, which is not easy. So the countries have to agree on a method including maybe just negotiating, to split the annuity of this uh, project among them. For instance, if there are three countries that are affected by this line, 17% uh, one country, 43% the other, and the rest 40% the third country. So the idea is that the countries split the cost. Once this is done, and of course, lots of uh, discussions have been in different parts of the world on how to do that. There are very poor methods, there are better methods, um, but in the end, what matters is that a method will be found. Once the method is found, each country will give priority to the payment that has been established in the same way and when, when we had a single country. So they will have to find a way to reinvent the amount of money that they have to pay for to cover their 40, 13 or 47 percent of the total cost of transmission. This method does not need to harmonize the regulation of the countries. This is always I've heard that many times that we need to harmonize the regulation. Otherwise, it is impossible to build cross transmission. No. With this method, the only thing that you have to do is to split the cost of the project into pieces, one for each country, and each country will manage in whatever way to collect that money. 
no harmonization is needed in this case. And of course, this is a measure of the commitment of the governments of the region, the involved uh, countries, uh, to, to have this uh, project built. So uh, during these two days, uh, several times some difficulties appeared, and these are true difficulties. Uh, one is, well, how to guarantee that the necessary fraction of the revenues that are obtained from the end consumer tariffs, not from the government, not from any other sources, from the tariffs that may amount to one or two or three percent of the cost of transmission of the total cost of, of the electricity will be reinfenced for this purpose. And that there is a guarantee, some scrow account, something that makes sure that this money will be always available. Second, well, the organization of the auctions, they are not trivial to organize. Uh, there are a lot of experience. There is a lot of experience in with independent power production, uh, but, but we have to adapt that to the case of transmission. There are experiences, as you have seen in the case of Brazil, but also other countries in Latin America, in Europe, in the United States, in Australia, etc. And third, there are other topics that are always cumbersome to solve, but this is nothing special of the approach of the, of the independent transmission project. Uh, this is finding in the rights of way. Uh, maybe this is something that the country, the government could facilitate prior to the to the auction, um, obtaining environmental permits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, the details uh, that have been studied carefully by people that have been involved in uh, ITP projects in other countries, you can found, find them in these uh, documents from the World Bank Group, from Gridworks, or um, uh, the third one is also is from, uh, I think, uh, the Inter International Finance Corporation um, and our USAID. Um, okay, so uh, the details are there, and well, I think that we are ready to have a, a panel discussion on, on the topic. I think that we don't have a, a break uh, now because we, I have talked only for 20 minutes, and we can start with the panel, if it is fine with you. Um, I have some questions for the panelists, and I think that the panel uh, that we have today um, is is focused now on action. I think that we have discussed um, during the last two days on what I have tried to summarize, what are the regulatory conditions, uh, what is the definition of this model, the, the, the independent transmission project model. And, and now what we would be looking for is, well, um, if this is a ITP model is, is promising, what can we do to make it possible, right? And for that, I have a few, um, I mean, categories of questions. And I think that the best way is to go one by one and then uh, look at the opinion of the different panelists on that. Of course, um, this is open, an open discussion, and you are experts in the topic. Uh, in many aspects, you know much more than I do. So I think that the idea is that if you want to raise your hand, to intervene, to say something, to introduce a new uh, viewpoint, uh, you are more than welcome to do that. We have time for this. But what in, in, in terms of structuring the discussion, what I have in mind is that uh, we could talk about this difficult topic, difficulty of reinfencing the remuneration. Of course, that requires some willingness from the government, willingness from the regulator, to set apart a small fraction of what is collected with the tariffs for this purpose. Is that possible? Can it be done? Second topic is educating the decision makers. So we have this willing mindset in mind, which is so obvious, right, to think of A is selling to B, crossing countries, um, at this one and that one, so we have to uh, accumulate the charges of this and that, or we are using a certain line to go from the seller to the buyer. 
um, I think that I have been trying to, to prove or to show to you that this is the wrong approach, but I think that the decision makers, many people continue thinking in this way, uh, and that makes difficult to think of transmission as a regulated infrastructure whose cost of service had to be remunerated. And let's forget about flows and other things to remunerate transmission. Um, also this idea that I have found in many occasions that private investment um, in some assets is interfering with security. Because no, because the, the owner uh, of transmission is not operating the transmission, it's just making it available. They didn't have any possibility of interfering, opening breakers, closing breakers. This is the role of the system operator. But lots of people think that, that it is risky for security to have private investment, uh, in, uh, to have transmission investment in private hands. Um, third, we have to eliminate incorrect regulation, such as making the remuneration of transmission dependent on the flows, but also updating the rate base uh, of transmission every year um, with the new technologies. Well, if you have a, in the ITP model, you have a contract, you built the line 17 years ago with a certain cost, and you receive an annuity to recover that cost over uh, 35 years. Um, there is no need, and it is just a complexity, unnecessary complexity, to update what was what you had to uh, to the cost of that line 17 years ago. The cost was that one, not not the cost of the new technologies that you could use to build that line today. So that would increase risk and would scare away investors, right? So let's try to look at. At, at the uh, practices that have been invented for some, maybe some good reason at some time, but that they are not adequate to attract private investment. And third, realize that, that um, cross-border projects are not that complex. We need to overcome only one important step, which is simplifying the allocation of the cost to the countries. But Again, that requires a discussion and I will be asking for your opinion on this. So I will stop my uh, presentation now. And I think that we can start looking at the uh, your opinion and we can go uh, in order uh, to look at the, the first topic, which is reinforcing the remuneration of critical transmission projects. And I will stop sharing my screen and I will welcome uh, our speakers. Um, uh, I think that will go in order. Uh, we have received a uh, communication from the first speaker, uh, the first panelist, Abel Didier Tela, the Director General of uh, the Association of Power Utilities of Africa, who is traveling in India, that unfortunately, although he was able to be connected yesterday, but today uh, he cannot join us. Um, then uh, we have uh, Ifi Ikeonu, uh, energy policy markets and regulation consultant, but he has had very important uh, jobs in regulation in Nigeria and also in the, uh, the regional regulator in um, Western Africa Power Pool, Herrera. I hope, yes, Elvira is here. So she's a lead energy specialist in, in the West Africa Energy Unit of the World Bank. We have been collaborating uh, several times already in the past in, in, uh, in these discussions about uh, transmission, transmission cost allocation, transmission investment. Uh, welcome and thank you very much for joining us very early from the United States. Uh, we have Wallace Olivari, uh, our staunch supporter from the African Development Bank and the Director of Energy Financial Solutions Policy and Regulation at the African Development Bank. And we have Tilana de Mayon, uh, Senior Operations Officer, Infrastructure Upstream Africa at the International Finance Corporation, a specialist in uh, transmission topics in Africa. And last but not least, as it usually said, James Manda, 
that has been participating several times already in our uh, events. Uh, he is the technical manager of the African Forum for Utility Regulators, AFUR. So, well, I think I will follow the, the order and I will go to the, the first topic, which is this difficult thing of how to ring fence the money that is needed to pay dutifully every year uh, the revenue, uh, the annuity of specific transmission projects. Um, Ify, do you have any uh, anything to say about this? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ignacio. And again, uh, let me also thank the the ASR Gridworks and uh, all the partners for the opportunity of participating uh, in this uh, webinar. Um, I followed the discussions over the last uh, two days over this very very. Uh, <laughs> interesting uh, issue. And of course, uh, uh, Ignacio, you've talked about how this is so topical, especially coming from the point of uh, policy and re regulation, which is uh, where you know I come in here, basically. Yeah, so uh, going specifically to the issue you raised in terms of uh, ring fencing, in terms of uh, that being an option, for ensuring the security of payment for independent uh, transmission projects, which I think we've all agreed uh, is the way forward, is the way to deal with the challenges we have in terms of uh, developing a uh, transmission infrastructure all across Africa. Uh, how do we then deal with the payment basically? Uh, uh, for me, yes, uh, ring fencing does make a lot of sense, and uh, but, uh, the more I, you know, I have listened to the conversations uh, over the last couple of days. Uh, yes, I do see the value of that, but my primary concern in terms of that approach, you know, how does it work, uh, given our peculiar challenges within the African context, exactly, is um, the challenges of treating uh transmission projects in isolation of uh, other infrastructural uh, projects uh, within the entire value chain yes i did listen to your point you made which i agree with in terms of saying that we need to move away from the mindset of looking at transmission purely as a buying and selling commodity and also looking at it as a structure but i think that also would be the same pretty much for all the other value chains, be it generation, uh, transmission, distribution, and all of that. Because indeed the power sector is first and foremost infrastructure, but of course we've also moved now to the realm of the energy markets and how to deal with the issues arising therefrom. So for me, a certain point in terms of uh, ring fencing, which is again what we've advocated in terms of regulation, uh, over the last few years is that it starts even with the mindset of, uh, of ensuring that uh, we begin as regulators to not only uh, prescribe um, cost separation, you know, but also finding ways of making that work. Because recall that primarily most of uh, the utilities uh, on the continent continues to remain vertically integrated. Uh, there has been attempts pretty much uh, in terms of trying to regulate cost separation. Um, that hasn't worked as well as some of us would have wanted it to, basically. And I think if we do not, first of all, find a way of ensuring that regulators and policy makers, you know, first and foremost, deal with that very, very important issue of ensuring cost separation, then it may also not be practical to implement the ring fencing of costs that you have prescribed because one comes from the order basically. So remember that even when we're looking at our tariff methodologies and all of that, you're looking at, yes, I, I do agree that, um, you know, that we need to find um, other ways of treating transmission, but still, uh, when you look at the issue of Re-regulated assets is based on that assumption that you must know clearly what falls within which, you know, what uh, infrastructure uh, assets fall within which heading. So it has to be clear in terms of what is the cost of generation, what is the cost of 
transmission, what is the cost of distribution? At least you know that first, basically. Then you begin to say, okay, fine. In order for us to encourage um, more private sector participation in uh, transmission projects, then we have to find a way of dealing with costs. Again, uh, remember, I mean, you... Oops, I think that there is some problem with communication. Well, um, in the meantime, if she does not recover, I think that her point has been made. I think it's important that we need some kind of uh, clarity, transparency in accounting separation between the different activities so that we could implement this idea uh, more um, efficiently. Uh, let's continue with, um, I think that, well, if, if you don't want to talk about some specific topic, you are uh, free to, uh, Ify, we have lost you for- Sorry, that's okay. I, again, um, part of, well, this is not transmission failure. I guess it's <laughs> some other communication failure was well, certainly not from transmission. So let me just uh, round up by saying, yes, um, I think it's something that we have to work towards. But I also think that a major enabler in terms of ensuring that we begin to work towards reinforcing of costs would also be to ensure that we find ways of actually implementing cost separation in terms right. of all of those regulated entities. That is a good starting point. Yeah. Then we can kind of elevate that. To yeah, I was trying to summarize yeah. your intervention by saying that Accounting sure. preparation will be very helpful for this. It would be very, yeah, exactly. So I'll stop there for now. Great. Um, Elvira, what do you have to say about this topic? Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. Well, first and foremost, let me thank you for inviting the World Bank to be part of this conference. And also, uh, I mean, let me congratulate the organization of the conferences and all the panelists. I've uh, not been able to attend the whole conference, but I've been attending a critical session and yesterday, uh, nearly the whole conference. So I, I must say, I've uh, there's been a very rich discussion uh, touching on the main challenges that affects uh, uh, the ITP model in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I've learned a lot personally from the perspective of very different stakeholders. So I'm glad to provide the perspective of the bank because for us, transmission is a main line of business. In fact, uh, overall Africa, the World Bank has uh, committed over $10 billion to projects uh, transmission project delivering almost 50,000 kilometers of transmission uh, networks and we have uh, additional seven billion dollars in uh, in pipeline and uh, a very important uh, um, part of this investment is allocated to the construction of uh, regional networks um, I am the coordinator for the regional portfolio in Western Africa and uh, for the past 10 years uh, uh, in the Western African power pool only we have commissioned above two billion dollars. Um, of funding and help construct more than 4,000 kilometers of cross-border transmission lines, which make a large part of the web uh, network as of today. And we've also been involved uh, in uh, helping uh, uh, building the market fundamentals, you know, the institutions, uh, regulations. Uh, in fact, you know, we have been helping WAP uh, prepare the grid and market code, and we are now involved um, in the discussion concerning uh, um, a potential new methodology for pricing transmission services across the regional network. I've, uh, I mean, I've learned a lot from this discussion, and I believe you have touched on an important point, which is that you know the government will. That's what you just the way you just define, or what I will say, the political dimension that affects the transmission business for many reasons. I mean, a segment that is particularly vulnerable to market failures because it's a monopoly, and there is also this issue of security. Um, and with transmission network being part of, you know, being the typical public good completely in the hands of the government for what is perceived as a security concern, then obviously political economy consideration affects this business more than ever. And then also the affects whether and how private participation can indeed uh, expand in this segment. And I will say the political dimension is even more important when we talk about uh, cross-border interconnection. Now, before going into the details, because I guess we will have time, you'll get back to me uh, later on. Let me respond on the specific question you posed on 
on wing fencing and the cost allocation. I mean, yes, of course. Um, but as uh, if you just said, uh, this requires a uh, um, clear mindset when it comes to regulation. I would say also requires uh, um, pretty strong regulation uh, capacity. But, you know, the World Bank has, I mean, all the investment we have done in the transmission uh, business are in public investments. Uh, do we believe that's the way to go? No, absolutely not. Actually, we believe that more financing is needed and uh, attracting the private sector is uh, uh, paramount, and uh, we firmly believe that this is also part of our mandate. Uh, in fact, you know, private capital mobilization is at the core of our agenda. At the World Bank, while the bank, where I see it, works upstream, helping fixing power sectors to reform, we have our group extends to the IFC, and Talia, my colleague, is going to speak after me, and, and MIGA, that are in the business of private sector finance and risk mitigation. We have an experience uh, that is pretty wide in the generation segment. Do we want to uh, trigger power participation in the transmission sector as well? Yes, uh, absolutely. But uh, there is no, uh, not yet any experience um, in the um, in the regional context. We have been involved with uh, um, quasi uh, private uh, uh, business model, special purpose vehicle, and I refer to Transco. The the company has been set up to uh, construct and operate the Côte d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea Interconnection, or the ONVG, Organisation pour la mise en valeur du fleuve Gambie. But, you know, once again, these are companies that are fully owned uh, by the government participating in the construction of the infrastructure. So we do not have yet a model uh, or experience, a record, uh, to test whether or not wind fencing is possible in the transmission segment. But if we go back to the experience of the degeneration segment, I mean, a lot has been tried already. In 2018, the bank had what we call a developing financing operation. So it's a structural loan that we give straight to the balance of payment. And for the first one, we made one of such loan to six countries, all the countries involved in the CLCG uh, interconnection, plus uh, Burkina Faso and Mali. Um, it was a $300 million overall loan um, that was arranged for the first time as a regional loan. So all the countries together with action, precondition to access the loan that will affect all of them uh, together. And a major, you know, major condition was uh, uh, asking these countries to um, um, clear payment arrears for electricity bills, especially from independent power producers. So a lot of models were on the table and were discussed with these countries at that point of time. There were uh, uh, arrears payment plans or ring fencing through different mechanisms, such as uh, escrow account, cash waterfall mechanism. Well, guess what? Um, nearly all six countries, uh, they committed uh, to, this, uh, to these methods. But the problem in the end is that since this is still you know, all transaction where between uh, uh, national public utilities. Ultimately, the question was, was whether or not this utility had enough money to pay for the bill, whether they had enough revenues. And when, for instance, the option of an escrow account, I, if I recall correctly, that was the choice made by uh, Liberia, was considered and set up, then the problem was whether or not that would be financed. I mean, whether the escrow account will ultimately set, be set up uh, by the government. And in the case of Liberia, Liberia this didn't happen. So what I'm trying to say is that, yes, of course, we can uh, um, discuss wide and large about different tools, but ultimately there are two main issues to be addressed. First and foremost is the political willingness. And uh, to this date, contract negotiation, including uh, uh, transmission service agreement, whether or not it's a public uh, infrastructure or a private one, is heavily, heavily influenced by political consideration. The disputes on TSAs right now in the regional market are dealt at the political level. So there is no certainty on this contract. And of course, this will create a, a barrier for uh, uh, private investors. And second, the financial viability of national uh, public vertical integrated utilities is a major source of risks, both with, for internal markets, national markets, and international ones. So at the end of the day, these two main determinants are the one that most critically define the enabling environment. So the environment needs to be there. That's the type of efforts that needs to be made upstream 
um, before we can consider uh, different regulations. So I will say that, especially in Western Africa, the complexity really lies uh, um, in the financial weaknesses that affect uh, national utility nearly everywhere in the sub-region. And second, the political willingness of countries to do so, a will that is also uh, shaped by shifting uh, um, political interest, political transition, shifting international alliances. So nearly every day, for instance, in West Africa, we are faced with a new political environment to work with. And the ability or the willingness of countries to cooperate with one another, to open their markets among themselves, let alone to the private sector, remains in question and is, uh, and is an effort that needs to be, you know, is made every day once again. Yeah, so, well, that, you know, I, I just... somehow with what um, Ify was saying before, uh, I mean, that the, uh, the difficulties uh, that you are indicating of the financing uh, the, the public companies and to give, um, to, to make the decision makers, uh, politicians, uh, to realize the importance of transmission. I mean, if he was talking about that, that um, well, um, you have different um, um, activities in the value chain, and that all of them are important. I think that that in some cases, and I would say in most cases, some critical transmission projects um, have priority, um, in the sense that, in terms of uh, cost to benefit ratio. Uh, they would rank very, very high because the cost is quite small and the benefit, they are impeding uh, the deployment of large volumes of renewables. They are impeding that um, that that load, the, the distribution have access to cheaper resources. They are impeding that the market could exist because countries are too small. Uh, so I think that, that the critical importance, not of every investment in transmission, but some... Um, critical and particularly cross-border transmission projects um, should have priority. Uh, and that links to the other question that maybe you, I mean, you have addressed and other people, I mean, other of the panelists could do also, which is uh, the other topic that I presented as educating the decision makers, making them, uh, I mean, aware of the importance of transmission, uh, the large cost benefit, benefit to cost ratio, and and what are the models that they could use and that they could uh, they could resort to private investment? So let's continue. Uh, and Wale, please. I mean, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof, and uh, thank you to all the panelists uh, for the insightful contributions. Um, I agree with uh, what has been said so far. Um, you know, without wanting to repeat what uh, people have already said, I think the key issue is the viability of our utilities, the liquidity in the value chain, because in many countries you find their significant payment arrears. And we at the African Development Bank have also had issues on projects where the utility was supposed to set up an escrow account and that has not been done. And so the issue is their um, willingness to pay and also their ability to pay. You know, So the contractual issues and the regulatory issues are fine on paper, but when it comes to implementation. And then you also have the issue around um, even where you have regional interconnections and you're selling electricity uh, cross-border, um, you know, political issues. Uh, so, for instance, uh, we recently saw uh, when there was a military coup in Niger, Nigeria decided to cut off the electricity to Niger. And, and this was in a privatized environment where uh, the, the country that was transmitting the generation company um, was a private company, but they just had to obey the uh, directive from the government. So, so there are issues like that. And also, as you know, um, uh, there are significant areas, uh, even with these cross-border electricity uh, um, arrangements, 
uh, because these are often political deals as opposed to they're not driven by the economics, you know, so you can have uh, uh, an interconnection between Benin and Nigeria or, you know, and they may not be paying, settling their bills. Many of the utilities in the region have cross-border areas. So um, to get the private sector comfortable, you have to be sure that all these payments are going to be made. And, uh, you know, wearing a, a banking hat, you because these arrangements are not yet tried and tested, you're going to be asking for uh, sovereign guarantees. You know, all the all the countries that are supposed to make the payments, even if after you've agreed the sharing formula, you will ask for sovereign guarantees. But as we know, countries are no longer able to provide these guarantees. You know, they're all reaching the the you know the cap in terms of their debt sustainability limits. And another issue that uh, has not really been mentioned is is this whole issue of currency risk, because what you'll find is that you run an auction and most of the companies that will qualify maybe are um, coming from overseas. Um, you know, one thing our countries need to move away from, taking these long-term loans in hard currency. It's difficult, but if you look at the, um, the example from Brazil or look at examples from India, you'll find that these loans are probably denominated in local currency because those markets are deep enough for you to be able to raise local currency loans. But in our case, if you want to finance these transactions in hard currency, um, the, the, the currency risk, how are you going to transfer that? So when, uh, Prof, in your presentation, you were saying um, there's no impact on the sovereign, um, there I would respectfully disagree because <laughs> there is an impact on the sovereign and, and that's where we always come and start. So the first place in Africa where I, th I feel, I think these privately financed transmission deals will happen will most likely be in South Africa. We've seen the success with the REIPPs and they finance most of these deals in RAND. And as I understand it, there's an ITP office that is being established uh, in South Africa, following the same example as the IPP office that they had. Um, so the currency is extremely important. Payment security is absolutely vital. And one other thing that is very important as well, the planning function and being able to sequence. A country like Brazil is big. You can plan the network and how it all fits together. Um, in Africa, we're talking about the... Um, the continental master plan, et cetera. But um, there needs to be coherence in the planning and you have to be able to send the right signals to the private sector because in some countries, procurement processes will move fairly fast. But in other countries where there's so much inexperience, these things take a long, long time. We've seen the fact that it takes us on average seven years to close uh, IPP projects in Africa. So um, these private sector uh, deals just take time because capacity needs to be built. But for me, the most important inhibitor actually is currency, as far as I can see. It's, it's a huge deal and not enough attention is paid to that when we talk about financing infrastructure across Africa. Maybe I'll stop here. Yes, well, I agree with you. Thank you very much, Wale. Um, that, um, yeah, that that doing something uh, involving several countries uh, is is very challenging. Uh, I was involved in the uh, deployment of uh, this eighteen hundred kilometer line joining six countries in Central America. I was the advisor. Uh, the, the chairman of the, the committee advising the governments in this project, uh, it took 25 years to have the project done. Uh, <laughs> there were changes in the governments. There was war between Nicaragua and El Salvador. We had meetings 
<laughs> with the participants of the countries. We continued having the meetings, uh, but um, but the, the countries were not very friendly um, at the time. But things happened, and finally, a, a special purpose vehicle company was created. Uh, these countries also have problems, currency, and all that. But a private investment project was was finally done, right? Um, so yes, I am aware of the difficulties, but something has to be done <laughs> to have transmission uh, deployed. Uh, so, okay, Tilana, you are next. Um, give us some uh, hopeful message, please. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I will tell you that we are quite heavily involved in, in a lot lot of the projects um, and initiatives within Africa. And there is a, a lot of movement and a lot of momentum that is being built. I mean, uh, talking about 25 years, IPPs has been has started 20 to 25 years ago. And you, I mean, it took the time that it took, right? And today we can't imagine our life without it. And the World Bank linking up report on private sector participation in transmission, which is the first one of its kind. And up till now, not very few people know about it. It's only 2017. So hopefully it is just a matter of time. I see a lot of momentum from when I started in this position at IFC looking at promoting private sector financing and participation in transmission since 2021. And so I'm hoping that the tipping point will come. Um, but we also know that a lot of these uh, private investment um, models started out of necessity. It came from Peru that was the, the where the electricity sector was crippled. There was um, large um, blackouts and load shedding happening. And so, you know, I, I want to ask the question, you know, how far does it have to go before we actually get that tipping point? That being said, we know that there's a lot happening. Um, Uganda has recently completed a framework for private sector participation in transmission. Kenya is embarking on a, a program um, that has been ongoing for three years already on IPTs specifically, and now recently South Africa. I'm part of the team that um, has an advisory engagement with the National Treasury. And as of September, there was nothing. So the, the signals that we see about IPT offices being established um, and you know all the work and the momentum that comes with it, all the stakeholders working together to find solutions rather than um, you know talking about excuses like the regulations on in place is really, really positive. So hopefully this is a signal um, and that it could move forward. I agree with Ify that I don't think that the answer is just ring fencing some of the um, utility revenues today. The reason why I'm saying that is because even if it's small, it might impact the overall sustainability of the utility. And considering that unbundling of tariffs and the move towards cost reflective tariffs are quite contentious and that it might require some time to move towards this, um, we need to look at short term options that could ensure a revenue stream for transmission projects. Uh, um, and some of these we've been looking at specifically for South Africa and other other countries that we are working on actively. Um, for example, the generation linked projects. So is there a way that you can have a generation that is dire needed um, to connect also to also include the transmission line, which makes the revenue payment more appealing and less difficult to, to swallow. Is there models where there's the off-taker pay? So we have areas, um, you know, um, mining uh, hotspots uh, and other areas where there's big industrial activity that could potentially unlock some transmission revenues. Um, and we see that in the areas of Zambia, DRC, Tanzania, and so forth. Um, and we're looking at those. Also, um, the using some of the, the lines that has revenue flows on them that might have been funded through public sector or concessional funds and ring fencing some of those revenues. Specifically, I'm talking about interconnectors where there are bilateral agreements, where there are guaranteed energy flows that's been um, proven over a number of years that these lines have been involved and monetizing those assets. So, you know, there are other models um, they are far and few. They will not resolve our a dire need of transmission infrastructure across the board, but and they might actually be very limited, in fact. But it could help to develop a few success cases 
that again could be used to in, uh, increase the body of knowledge, increase the capacity, develop you know the sector and help it to mature towards a more sustainable long-term approach. Thanks. Okay, that will be our job, right, at the AGSR. Thank you very much. And then we go to uh, James. Uh, well, this is the association uh, of the regulators, the forum of utility regulators. So you have also a mission similar to ours uh, in, in creating capacity building and you are doing a great job in that. So what is your vision on, on this important topic? So th thank you very much, uh, Prof. And uh, thank you, uh, my fellow panelists. So after all these eminent persons have contributed to the various subjects on the table, uh, I, I would like to, to add on from the point of view of two, uh, two points. Uh, first of all, the African Forum for Utility Regulators is an am amalgamation of uh, utility regulators in different sectors in Africa. However, the difference is that uh, we are not an authority. Uh, up to now, it is still uh, voluntary and uh, the, there's no compelling regulators uh, to be members of our four. So that in itself presents a challenge because uh, we heard yesterday that uh, we, you know, th there's a lack, a serious lack of uh, uh, regulatory frameworks and, the, you know, just to monitor what is happening in the transmission networks. So from the regulatory oversight point of view, you know, independent regulators are supposed to monitor and enforce the ring fencing rules to ensure compliance. Uh, th this, this will help perhaps to maintain a level playing field and protect the interest of consumers. However, th there's no, I know Prof said that uh, uh, this can work in any sort of regulation, re regulatory environment. However, for cross-border uh, trading, for cross-border transmission projects, there must be some form of un uniformity in how we can regulate cross-border projects. And right now, there's serious lack of capacity in you know, forming regulatory frameworks that could achieve our aspirations. Uh, that will call for a serious rethink on how regulators should be trained and who should train them. And so my contribution I would not end my contribution without calling upon uh, various stakeholders to seriously train regulators in very specific areas, especially in the transmission, in how to regulate transmission and also cross-border transmission. The other fact, and I think that uh, either Wale or I don't know, one of the panelists mentioned it, the challenge arises from the fact that most, not if all, transmission or you know, companies, electricity companies in Africa are vertically integrated, government owned, and they are seriously in the red. And so with regards to financial separation, financial ring fencing, the principle is very good. Each entity has its own separate financial accounts, and funding sources. This helps to ensure that funds are not transferred inappropriately between different parts of the business. However, for a vertically integrated government-owned utility, this would be very difficult. And so the political will that either Evra or Tilana mentioned is a factor that must be considered very seriously. And when we talk about the training uh, mandate the training needs for regulators. This must you know, extend all the way to the decision makers. And we must formulate a mechanism where we reach out to those uh, government entities that are responsible for the function of electricity. They must understand 
at least at a basic level, the need for a viable transmission system. The other factor is that, uh, you know, other than the financial separation, which will be very difficult in the present circumstances where utilities find themselves in the red. Why wouldn't we try legal separation, for example, which involves creating separate legal entities of different parts of the business, generation, transmission, and distribution. Each entity operates independently and it has its own management, but falls under one, uh, you know, corporate structure, one corporate head office, but uh, no uh, reporting separately. That would send a signal and it would be very easy to separate financially. Financial separation would be very easy in such a circumstance. Uh, the other issue really is on the regulatory oversight. I think that the, we still have very different, you know, countries have different mandates of regulation. Remember that other countries have the ministries of energy responsible for regulation. Whilst other countries have set up independent regulatory bodies. So we've got a different mix of regulatory regimes across the continent. And so in order to bring together all these regimes for them to understand the need for uh, independent transmission uh, participants, we really need to, you know, emphasize on the education of stakeholders. And I think that uh, your organization, the SRA, and our organization can work very closely to identify suitable partners that can train regulators in these issues. Because without an appropriate understanding of what we need to achieve, you'll be surprised that you know at the parliament level of different countries, there's very little understanding of what the value chain in electricity is. Generation, transmission, distribution, and supply should be considered separate. But how many people at parliament level understand these issues? And so our education our educating the regulators must seriously consider all stakeholders so that when we begin to look at the cross-border uh, transmission systems, you know, the differences in the, the approach must not hinder the, the construction of these projects. Here in Southern Africa, for example, the bottleneck in transmission is between Zambia and Zimbabwe, all right? There's a serious bottleneck there. Only 200 megawatts of power can be transmitted each hour. So, and this problem has been identified for a long time. Now, here's what happens. The individual country interests override the regional and continental interests. And so we must really begin to think of how do we governize countries to begin to think about uh, continental or regional interests, okay? So we have a lot to do as participants, as stakeholders in trying to you know, bring to fruition our aspirations, especially in transmission. And the, you know, without, you know, the, without these companies making a profit as it is now, how do we even begin to think about financial separation, ring fencing of the transmission network? So those are the issues that I have uh, regarding uh, this well thought of uh, aspiration of ring fencing transmission. It can work, I agree, it can work in every regulatory regime, but the circumstances in which uh, these vertical integrated utilities find themselves is quite dire. And we must begin from the source. So education, uh, profitability, and uh, maybe sometimes legal separation. Then once we do these things, we may begin to move towards uh, a fully fledged transmission system that can be viable and profitable. Thank you.
<coughs> Professor, you are muted. Some noises here. So yes, thank you very much. You are providing a lot of uh, food for thought and your uh, answers are being uh, very, uh, very rich. I think that we have time to go through the other major topic that I think that, that we have to cover. And I will be asking you to do that in inverse order. So um, maybe uh, we can start with Tilana and then go back and then the last one will be James. Um, so the, the, the topic that I want to bring that I said before is that the current regulation, uh, regardless whether we are doing this with ITP or any other uh, of the different approaches to try to attract uh, private investment, um, has some features that scare away investors. So if we are having um, the remuneration of transmission that depends on uncertain things, such as the volume of the flows in the lines. Or if we have um, regular, I mean, updates every year or every other year or something of the value of the rate base based on the current technologies and not with the historical cost. Or if we don't define what happens at the end of the contract, if there is a concession and we don't say whether the residual value will be paid or what, this is not mentioned. Or if we are creating uh, penalties or credits to the owners or the of the transmission network uh, based on things that they cannot control, uh, such as uh, the reliability of the entire system or uh, the value of congestions or losses that depend on what happens in the rest of the network, then that will be very difficult uh, to to invest because there are uh, regulatory uncertainties that have been created that are not necessary, but are there. And that will increase the cost of capital or just directly um, impede uh, private investment. So what do you think about the current regulation, about these regulatory uncertainties, in my opinion, unnecessary that, that we already have in our regulatory regimes? So let's start with, I think in the reverse order is Tilana. If you have something to say, or you want to add something, because I think this is that will be the last uh, round that we will make, and then you will have to, to say anything that you would like to highlight at the end of the, of the panel. Thank so, you. The floor is yours, yeah. Thank you so much. I think a few points that I want to make. Um, the first one is that um, I don't think there's anything unique about transmission. I mean, we've talked about it, whether you can do IPTs similar to IPPs, that there's a lot of overlap. Um, because transmission is an asset and infrastructure part, as if you also said, um, that's only part of the integrated electricity supply network. And it's very and perfectly suited for fully private or PPP approaches. We have seen PPP approaches in a lot of infrastructure across Africa. So I believe that although stronger regulations will help to mature the market and, and give more correct signals and comfort to the private investors and all the stakeholders and shareholders along the value chain, it is not it is not a hindrance that that and, and more of an excuse. Um, my view is that it is probably more complicated, considering that uh, we don't know what we don't know, and it's not been implemented fully, but somebody has to take the plunge. So although we do need more regulations and stronger um, signals, it's not, for me, something that should be holding up the sector, especially considering this dire need. Um, it's a very imperfect analogy, but... Uh, talking about a house, I mean, why would you build a house with your own money if you can finance it using the bank and leverage the debt on that? I mean, transmission is not a house, but it's one of these things that you could leverage the debt and, and other sources to, to get further. That being said, um, public uh, private sector is not everything. It should not take over the full spectrum of funding it's a 
supposed to complement and there will be lines that is more strategic and lines that might not have the required commercial case and others that will have more of that. So it's complementary to the public sector funding and other funding sources, and it should be seen as that. And therefore, we need to work to something that could really extend the, the size of the market. Um, as I mentioned, there's really short-term things that we can do. Um, and really, it is for the private models, is the securing of the commercial funding um, that is effectively requiring the stable revenue flows. And therefore, we need to get comfortable with the value for money and cost benefit analysis for transmission projects specifically. You know, what is the cases that we can make? We can displace diesel, which is expensive. You can, in the same vein, reduce your GHD emissions, which you can get climate financing for. You know, there's um, efficiencies that private sector can bring in. There's a whole lot of um, economic and commercial benefits that we need to use to make the cases on a few strategic projects that could then unlock um, practices that can be done um, in the long term. Um, I talked about cross-border projects. Some of them are really um, exciting because of the fact that they have secure revenue flows um, that has linked uh, revenues and, and so on. A lot of these projects has been funded by grant funding. You know, so the li those lines have revenues that could potentially be ring fence and that could be used. Um, blended finance structures is available through a lot of DFI sources. Um, but we need to make the case. We have to show the project. We need to use this effectively. It doesn't just come um, along. We need to motivate why they could be effectively used, and we can do that. Um, there's a lot of interest towards um, risk mitigation tools, political risk insurance, payment guarantees, um, and so forth that could um, address related concerns initially but we have to have a view to phase them out. So we have been talking in the context of South Africa, in the context of Mozambique, uh, in Kenya, around tools that could be deployed to make these projects bankable. And we should push through with these, at least initially, to get some of these projects funded. Um, and then lastly, just bringing it back again, is all of this will have to flow into our capacity building, content development, and, and skilling up our resources across Africa so that we can get more comfortable with IPTs and private sector models in transmission that similar to how we have gotten comfortable to IPPs. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tilana. Um, yep. Uh, I think that that uh, makes clear the case that we have to, to learn by doing. And I think that the the experiences that are going on in several countries that you mentioned, I think that it will be important to see how they go and, and to, to learn from, from those and, and try more until uh, we um, make a transmission investment to become a, like a normal thing, right? Um, as you say- I hope next year, this time we will have a project already. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I'll try to do it to do have some a new event soon, so that you could uh, talk about that. Okay, so going up in my list, uh, Wale is next. Um, right. Yes, I I just wanted to say that look, it's it's not a one size fits all. Uh, many of us forget that the perhaps the most successful example of privately. Uh, run transmission in Africa today is copper belt electricity. Mm -hmm. And and there the government actually built the assets first. So it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, all green fields. There's brownfield. And I actually think to get private sector investment in a lot of countries, it's quicker, often quicker for the government to build the asset using public money, and then you can privatize. So in the case of uh, Copper Belt, they're also partially listed on the stock market. And that's another way of, of raising private sector capital. You know, they, they, can, they can come into the equity of the company, and then that, that company can also go out and raise debt. So that is, there are different models that we can consider. And in situations like Zambia with the copper belt supplying, you know, the, the copper belt mining areas, 
that's like a disc discrete um, area that they were able to privatize. And if we have other examples of such, that may be a model to 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 follow. Um, for me, I always get worried in situations where uh, only DFIs are doing the the deals, the financing. That means the sector is not sustainable. We have to find a way of getting local financial institutions, local commercial banks, local pension funds, uh, local insurance companies, they have to be doing these deals. That's the only way it's gonna be sustainable. So we can have one or two demonstration, uh, privately financed T-lines, put blended finance in, we overstructure it with all the belts and braces. That will just be a demonstration model. We, we won't be able to roll it out across the board until we find a way of getting local institutions uh, to, to start financing these things. And again, you have to look at the macroeconomic environment. It's the same reason why in many countries you don't have mortgages. People build homes from you know their own uh, savings, uh, which doesn't help the economy, but we because the local institutions have very high financing costs. And if you're lending long-term, compound interest is going to kill uh, your project. So the macroeconomic environment has to be uh, right. You, you know, I mean, it often helps to have uh, low inflation, single-digit interest rates, and access to long-term capital. So how do we build the financial infrastructure to be able to support these kind of long-term investments. And many people don't, they forget that side. You know, it's the entire jigsaw puzzle has to fit. And, and so I think if there's enough capital to do these deals, things like regulations and rules, uh, we, can, we can deal with those things, but the business model has to be right. So there will be some structures where you are, maybe supplying electricity to, to a mine and it's a point-to-point -point transmission line. And that's already happening, you know, where you just factor that into the cost of building your electricity generation uh, and, and the end customer is able to pay for it. In certain situations, you may have to take brownfield has, assets that are um, rehabilitated. In, in Nigeria right now, they're talking about, in the new Electricity Act, they're talking about decentralization and for the state governments to start uh, building their own transmission lines, et cetera, you may have to um, basically uh, split up the, the national transmission company, um, but you maintain the central planning function. And part of that maybe could be privatized. So there are different structures and there's the IPT model again. So. I don't want us to think there's only a one size fits all um, because it has to work in the specific environment. Uh, that there's some countries that have been very successful in doing IPPs, and they've done several, and they 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 have the you know stability to do it. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire is an example where you know uh, an IPT model could be considered because there's experience and capacity in, in, in that market. So, so that would be my, you know, my contribution to say, let's look at what's worked, let's try and replicate that, and then also try new models. Um, but it's very important that the entire ecosystem has to be there uh, to make it sustainable, and you have to get local capacity and local financial institutions involved. So that's it, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I think that we very well uh, made the point of the importance of the local uh, financial strength uh, to make things like this one uh, possible. Um, okay, so um, going up in my list, uh, Elvira is next. We are going a little bit over time, but I think that, that people are staying with us. I see that, that we have a stable audience because the interventions are very rich and very important. Okay, Elvira, go ahead. Well, thank you. I'll try to be brief. In fact, you know, Ignacio, if you allow me, let me take a little bit of your place, right? Uh, summarizing. I mean, uh, this uh, last round has been a super, uh, super interesting. And I believe what we've been trying to do is to address basically two questions. Uh, do we need to, re to regulate? And if so, what regulation? 
And, you know, we have seen three positions. Uh, so we have James Manda telling us that regulation is important because it's also about creating incentives and educating. And then we have Talia who's telling us, well, you know, the fact that regulation doesn't exist or if it exists is not the right one, there is not enough capacity, it should not be a shoe stopper. And then we have, uh, uh, Walidu just said, uh, um, one size doesn't fit all. I couldn't agree more. So going back to the issue, why do we regulate? I tend to agree with Talia. I mean, first and foremost, there's a huge difference where we are talking about a domestic market. So a regulator that needs to address the border of our countries vis-a-vis -vis a regional regulator. So when it comes to national regulation, what is important, not whether or not the regulator exists or has enough capacity, but whether or not it's independent, because that makes a lot of difference. When it comes to the regional regulation, I mean, uh, I don't mean to be blunt, but let's see, you know, let's say that it's not necessarily needed, meaning that, you know, there are uh, power pools, and I'm thinking about Southern African power pool that work just fine with an association of regulators. While I believe that perhaps both in the Western African power pool and Eastern African power pool, we have kind of used a top-down approach, you know, perhaps there's been a lot of overthinking about regulation. At the end of the day, what is most important for any business, and, and you know, any business that is, you know, needs to attract private sector interest, is about making sure that you know all the stakeholders get their interest accommodated. So it's not about uh, you know how big is your size of the of the pie, which is what matters the most now to everybody, but it's just about increasing the pie. So let me give you two examples. When it comes to uh, you know, uh, entrance of IPPs or ITPs into a domestic market, we see a lot of uh, um, consumer segments that have been completely neglected. And this is the case of mining industries, as Talia said. Now there are two options there. One is Copper Birth Energy Corporation that jump on the business and construct an entire business case on this model. Or you have the case of Liberia and Sierra Leone with vertically integrated stranded utilities that cannot accommodate uh, demand from mines. They do not have enough money to uh, you know, in increase investment in transmissions, let alone in, in, uh, um, in, uh, in power generation. So these mines need to uh, you know, produce uh, their own, generate their own electricity and they become uh, captive customers. Now, those countries are net importers. They could sell or they could allow uh, generators from other countries, that, that being IPPs or, or uh, national utilities, to feed directly uh, this mining company. But they decide not to do so because they don't feel there will be a remuneration from them in there. And it's an acceptable argument. But what is the result? That no one gets benefit. So, you know, mines have to produce their own energies. IPPs do not develop, even though there is an entire untapped and large customer segments. And these utilities are very much financially challenged. They are giving up on the opportunity. So there, you know, the regulation will serve in making sure that in, if you allow third party access, which to me is the most important piece of, piece of regulation, then there is, a, there is also regulation that allows uh, all the stakeholders involved to get some kind of benefits. And there are many ways of, of doing this, you know, tariff levies, uh, agreements, uh, leasing, there are many things that can happen. Indeed, you know, open access exists, but is rarely enforced. So that's not about the regulation needs to be created, but the regulation needs to be enforced. The same applies to the regional picture. I mean, Ignacio, you and I have been cooperating on this whole discussion about the wheeling tariff methodology in the West Nottingham Power Pool. What's happening now? In 2008, they came up with this point-to-point -point tariff methodology in a contest where there was just bilateral trade normally between neighboring countries, so Nigeria, Tunisia. 15 years down the road, the situation has completely changed because now you have cross-border interconnection you know, crossing multiple uh, uh, countries. So even though the, 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 the agreements, the contracts are bilaterals between a seller and a buyer, the electrons need to cross several borders. So what's happened is that there are utilities or you know power companies like CNNG, they sit exactly in the middle of the market. And to them, you know, this point to point type is a great idea because they charge multiple times elections coming from Ghana or all the way from Guinea. On the other end, uh, so, so you know, your interest and your benefits entirely, entirely depend on where you fit in the market. But by exploiting this comparative advantage, by extracting these rents, you are killing the markets. So at the end of the day, what needs to be done there is first and foremost to you know, enforce third party access and do it so for real 
and there is a grid and marketing code that speaks right about it. It's taken two years to up to prepare, 18 months to Herrera to approve, and they're still stumbled on the editing of this document. So, and then and, and we have not even started the challenges because the real journey will be when the countries will have to comply with the grid and market code. But going back to the to the willing tariff methodology, well, there it's about all countries to understand that, as you said, is utterly inefficient to you know um, dictate the benefits based on where you sit on the market, on the amount of trade, or you know attach uh, you know associate benefit link benefits from a contract with the amount of power under the transaction. Ideally, you should have an entirely uh, integrated, synchronized markets where electrons can go back and forth and each and any TSO gets properly remunerated, but not depending on, on uh, transaction. Will it be able to get there? Well, is this about educating? Is this the regulation that will give them, you know, that will give them that? Well, honestly, based on the discussion I've been part of, especially in the past six months, which have reached unprecedented level of tension and controversy, it's at the end of the day, political will. I mean, I trust the CNRG or any other company in Western African Purple understands the power of a tariff that is not based uh, on transaction and on volumes. I mean, they know that in 20 years from now, they are set to gain. But, you know, politicians are kind of short-sighted, right? I mean, they follow the political cycle. So right now, there is not yet you know, the political will to move towards a different model. And mm -hmm. it's not a regulation that will do that. You know, it's first the mindsetting. Um, and we are working. I mean, what we are trying to do, we are to, going to we are trying to leverage the best of competencies we can and also use our dialogue country by country, trying to understand, you know, trying to help them understanding a little better how they can, you know, uh, overcome and pass this. But, you know, again, regulation will work only as long as, uh, there is a uh, political will and uh, uh, it's what we can do is to keep repeating like broken records that again it's about increasing the overall pie not making sure that everybody maximize the pies because this is going to kill markets you are not going to get a uh, private sector and then working in each country or in each sub-region when we talk about the regional markets looking at what is really needed and not overdo with regulation um, and again these two example uh, third party access and, and, the, and the willing tariff are two, you know, very, very significant, significant examples because the regulation exists, <laughs> it's there. It's just about making sure the countries finally decide to abide with them. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, political economy and uh, political willingness is critical and we are facing that all the time. Uh, that doesn't mean that regulation cannot do a good job. <laughs> Uh, so we have to to work on two fronts, and for us, the African School of Regulation, only one is what we have at hand. Um, so, um, Ify, uh, you are next. Hello, I you are. Yeah, hi. Okay, oh. so thanks again, Ignacio. Um, <laughs> I was just uh, listening to uh, Tilana, and all I was doing was just uh, nodding my head and saying, okay, she said it all, basically. <laughs> In terms of uh, a whole lot of challenges we face, whether country-wise or at the regional market and all of that. And um, again, um, I certainly also agree with Ignacio that, yes, um, for me, uh, talking from experience, you know, and uh, having worked as a, uh, as a as a regulator both in Nigeria and uh, in the ECOWAS regional market, and of course I'm working now with several regulatory uh, authorities all across Africa. The biggest challenge still remains, you know, what uh, Tilana had talked about, looking at uh, political will, looking at um, the challenges that we have in terms of executive interference and all of those related issues. But still, um, I am of the view that uh, good regulation has a key role to play in terms of also somewhat changing the narrative, even though it may be one step at a time, basically. Um, the question you raise in terms of what could be done, I mean, the reality today is that we can't even talk about regulation being a hindrance to ITPs to the extent that 
as has been agreed generally, we really do not have uh, a lot of those um, examples today uh, within the continent. Uh, a few countries have started uh, developing that, but for us right now, to be more like absence of whatever reg regulatory uh, frameworks that we need to talk about. But talking, I mean, I want to take it, you know, uh, look at it more from the policy approach, basically, because to the extent that a whole lot of what needs to be done to allow for a private uh, to allow for a private sector participation um, at the transmission level would need to come from policy directives allowing open access and um, allowing for um, open access allowing for a private sector uh, participation uh, in transmission of course uh, goes to what has been discussed by everyone that is we need to continue to engage with decision makers we need to build the capacity of those who ultimately make those decisions in understanding what the basic challenges are. Yes, we can do our best to put in place uh, all the key regulatory interventions, but to the extent that we continue to have regulatory authorities, which to my mind in Africa still remains largely immature and perhaps do not have the required independence and capacity to make decisions relating to the sustainability of the markets. That's in itself is something that we must find ways of dealing with holistically. I know I did make the point, uh, um, Ignacio, which you kind of challenged in the sense, okay, that we shouldn't treat um, um, transmission separately. For me, in all honesty, uh, for us to look at the development of the power sector, especially in Africa, uh, we must look at it, you know, from end to end, essentially, because one thing inevitably affects the other. I certainly do agree that the, you know, that there must be differences in how we deal with each of those regulated sectors, but they must also be looked at as one holistic entity. Because uh, if we do not address the issue, I think that was raised with, uh, you know, by. Uh, by Wale and uh, a number of the other speakers in terms of the financial sustainability of our utilities, in terms of the fact that we continue to deal with utilities that are largely state-owned, that also are not allowed to function independently or commercially. Uh, whether we try to ring fence, whether we try to regulate or put in place uh, all kinds of other intervention, the real challenge remains that reform must start from the way our utilities themselves are structured, from the way that regulators are allowed to interfere in terms of being given the right authority to do what they have been set up to do. Because more often than not, what I have noticed is that we kind of tend to tick the box, basically. Indeed, when you look at... Uh, the ERI index, which, uh, which uh, uh, Wally and his team, you know, always put together, that just gives you a very good, you know, snapshot of the, the major challenges we have on the continent. So on the governance, we do very well. Yes, we do the laws. On drain regulatory substance is a little bit, maybe somewhat lower. But when it comes to outcome in terms of how well are all of these being synced together to deliver on the promises, that is where the challenges are. And most of those challenges, to my mind, comes with some of the issues that have been discussed here, issues of political interference, issues of capacity. I think I really want to also talk about that quite a bit because that relates to what the, uh, what, uh, the African School of Regulation is all about. You know, to the extent that we still do not have the regulatory capacity to deal with a number of the issues that are needed to define how well the markets develops, to define how well transactions are supported to allow for market sustainability, then there was an urgent need that, that, that steps be taken to close that gap, basically. Um, it, of course, a lot of... Uh, uh, discussions have been talked about in terms of the ECOWAS tariff methodology. And I can tell you from being there that, of course, part of the challenge was at the beginning where we had that methodology. I mean, there were discussions about it, but no one knew what it was really about. So what it simply meant was that you relied heavily 
on what external consultants came to tell you that this is the best model. But maybe today, 10 years down the line, there's a lot of capacity. We have projects that have started. And I think uh, uh, it was a very that I'd say that it's, it, it is always best to start. We start, we may need to go back and amend some of the things that we've done. But if we don't start, then we don't make progress. So that still, still speaks to the issue of the need for us to have a targeted approach towards building capacity. And like uh, James has said, it's not just of regulators. We must start from the very top. A lot of our decision makers do not understand what this, what this sector is all about. We have lawmakers who are responsible for making energy laws. They have absolutely no idea. So our capacity building initiative must not only target just the regulators and the utilities, but we must have a focus in terms of also dealing with the executive and legislative arms of government in Africa, who surprisingly might have a lot more impact in terms of the, how the sector itself progresses than the re regulators themselves who we kind of think drive the market. It's not always the regulators. So the reality is uh, the challenges within the continents must also be dealt you know, from the local perspective of what is uniquely challenging in our own respect and find solutions. My approach again, and that is why I like this dialogue is that there have been a whole a lot of suggestions in terms of how do we move forward. So for me, in a nutshell, we must you know, focus more on building the capacity of regulators. We must make sure that we actually empower regulators through not just decision-making powers, but more importantly, the financial independence that would allow them to do what they need to do. We also must find ways of ensuring that we bring the decision makers around this dialogue table, we should invite them to the table, we should be able to have these discussions with them from time to time to also make them understand clearly how decisions made at the political and economic landscape inevitably you know, would uh, impact on how the electricity sector itself. Okay. Will. So yeah, thank you. we want to, to uh, finish on time and I would I was going to ask a, any uh, all of you to try to summarize in one sentence um, what is your main message I think that in your case is quite clear what you are saying right it is this capacity building for regulators and uh, for not only regulators but executive people in at the ministries etc and the independence of regulator are I am um, I mean, understanding what you say, do you want to say it in a different way? No, no you are right, Ignacio. I think that is uh, my one line summary, which you've just summarized. So that's okay. I'm okay. happy to take that. That's half the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Ify. Uh, so James, you are the, the last. And also, um, I would ask you to, if you have some statement to make and to summarize uh, your message in, in one sentence at the end. Uh, you are muted. I don't know if you are trying to talk. Maybe there is a problem of connection. Uh, have we encountered? All yeah. right. Can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Oh, great. Sorry. Uh, so I've, I've got a, a statement. You, you want just a statement at the very end. But before I come to the end, I think it's very important. Coming from a regulatory background, I think I also I also hear if a uh, uh, also coming from the regulatory back background we, we cannot we cannot end this meeting before we really emphasize on the need for reinforcing the regulatory capacity because we really need to define very clearly the role of regulation in all these transmission uh, independent uh, transmission uh, providers now just very briefly we we have we have a lot uh, the, the role of regulation is very crucial for ensuring fair access to the grid. You know, we maintaining the grid reliability, promoting uh, competition, and overseeing open access policies are just but a few uh, issues that regulators must be incapacitated on. They must understand 
that in order to prevent discrimination practices and ensure uh, transparent uh, transmission providers that are, you know, uh, the, the guidelines for, for grid uh, expansions, we, we need to coordinate the grid planning. Regulators must understand that that is their core role. So that at the end of the row, at the end of the day, once the, the grid has been expanded, new lines have been built, a, a compliance must be enforced, monitored and enforced with relevant laws and regulations so that we promote a level playing field for all uh, 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 market players. I cannot emphasize that enough. However, right now, as we speak, the level of uh, you know, the, the level of regulation in Africa, some is still at nascent level, some is quite advanced, but like I described, it's in different forms. So in order to enhance policy and regulation frameworks that is necessary to, to, to grow investments uh, that are needed uh, in transmission networks, uh, regulators must be trained appropriately. And that is what I'll close with. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Okay, so I will be looking for um, just a capsule um, that you will be sending to our audience. Um, and I'm going to ask Tilana and then Wale and then Elvira to finish with that. Uh, so Tilana, you are first. send us a message? So my one sentence, I think you've summarized as well. It is, can you hear me, Ignacio? Yes, yes, go ahead. I, I would say my one sentence you have mentioned already as well, it's learning by doing and then doing more and learning more. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, and then Wale, I think I know what you are going to say, but I want to hear <laughs> it. <laughs> yes, well, I'm, I'm very predictable. Um, my, <laughs> <laughs> well, my contribution is that it's not a, a one size fits all. There will be many models, but it's really important that we have to mobilize African savings to finance African infrastructure. And that's the only way in which you're going to have sustainable financing of uh, uh, critical infrastructure, whether it's for electricity or other sectors. Uh, otherwise, we'll just be doing demonstrations and that won't take us very far. Thank you. I think that I agree with you. And Elvira? Yes, my mm, more than one sentence perhaps, transmission is the backbone of the power sector and is uh, mostly relevant in Sub-Saharan Africa, where 50% of the population doesn't have access to electricity and the consumption is uh, a fraction of what we have in the US. So we must make it right. This is usually not going to work any longer, cutting private participation in the best form possible, in the most efficient form it is critical, and we all have to cooperate, bringing our different perspective. I also believe when it comes to regulation, let's be pragmatic, realistic, and let's make sure that there are benefits for all stakeholders involved so that, you know, the pie gets increased, not the individual slide. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that with this, we close this three-day conference. I don't think that our friends from GridWorks are connected, so, um, or Hanton, um, so on their behalf, I will uh, close this conference and uh, this is not the last word. So we will be coming, uh, you will be coming with us, I hope, uh, to have some uh, focused uh, discussion on transmission investment, how to attract private investment and to uh, learn by doing, to mobilize local, to use the different, different models, uh, to have regulators play the, the role that they have to play and uh, to make progress in this. Thank you very much to the audience and thank you very much uh, to our panelists and moderators. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you.